Did you, did as directors and actors, did you watch the, the Swedish original? I watched the first five actually, just to get a sense to see what they'd done, but um, but thought I'd stop there because I didn't want to take too many of their ideas, if you, if you know what I mean, and kind of like these guys, just kind of take it and then forget it and come up with our with our own way of doing it, basically. Um, I I just watched them. Um, there was a, a short trailer on on YouTube for it, which was about three minutes long, which I watched um, before we started filming, and then I didn't watch anything else because I didn't want to be influenced. Um, I didn't at even all. watch the trailer. How <laughs> <laughs> dedicated I was to not being influenced at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, you, you I said sneakily that. watched the trailer about halfway through filming because I got a bit scared that I hadn't watched any of it at all. <laughs> but then, uh, then I was happy to let it go. Yeah. I think when things are similar but different, it's not always helpful in that case to watch it because um, I know there are story bits in the original that uh, are very intriguing but don't happen um, to my character. I think it would have been a bum steer and so, um, yeah. so and the same best not to. The same for my character I think um, it's a quite a different direction for what happens to her and her backstory. So there's um, no use looking it up on Wikipedia. <laughs> you, it's, it's all wrong. <laughs> and so the themes are obvious but what was it that excited you about the whole idea of AI in the house? What, what, what for all of you I guess really what's what what's the appeal and what's the excitement of <coughs> I think you said it, in the house, it was the domestic viewpoint that everybody was so thrilled about and coming into this world. Also, you're not sort of showing the genesis of these machines, you're sort of, you come into a world where they're established, you're looking at it through the eyes of a family first and foremost, what these machines do to the existing strains and stresses in a family, uh, what they do to our feelings. That, looking at it from that angle felt like the most unique opportunity. I think that was the key part of the appeal for everyone. And it also felt quite relevant to now, I mean, even our relationship with our smartphones and our iPads and, you know, how we're kind of getting sucked into technology. Um, it felt quite relatable and also doesn't feel, well, we know isn't from the research we've done and the great clips you can get on tube, YouTube is that it's not that far away. So the, thing, the title sequence, is that all made up or is any of that real? Uh, some of it's real, some of it's made up. So, yeah, it's a mixture of the two. Yeah. Um, and so for the three, well, actually, first of all, Jim, I guess it, it, you had to play act if you like a machine. In, in this, how how's that as an acting challenge? Uh, yeah, it was really hard actually. Um, yeah, it was a unique sort of challenge. Um, really, you can't um, rely on all the usual things you do as an actor. You're not allowed to blink too much or cry or um, all of that stuff. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, we worked with an amazing um, choreographer called Dan O'Neill, who works with um, Frantic Assembly. That is his name. <laughs> I, I never got to know his name. I don't like to get to know names. <laughs> fantastic choreographer. Um, yeah. uh, <laughs> I actually think Dan O'Neill was the secret weapon a bit. He, what, he basically directed it, didn't he? Whoa, 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 whoa. I mean, <laughs> Steady. The great thing was that he was uh, allowed to be he's, there. He's here, that's why. Um, I'm, um, every somewhere. day, and that, 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 that there's a uh, language, I mean, not, I didn't play a synthetic, but uh, I was uh, full of admiration for how they had a, um, uh, a unified language, and I think that was down to how thorough. Uh, they worked yeah. we, we set up something called synth school didn't we very early on yeah and um we, with dan what we did uh, before everyone was cast actually we, we um we got some dancers and some choreographers about 10 of them and had a weekend and tried to figure out the rules of the synths and you know how they worked and um you know we, we knew from the off that we didn't kind of want any jerky kind of movements and how did you guys describe it like a like a uh, someone doing a japanese tea ritual yeah so what we start to do is figure out how you know the rules of the movement, if you like, and um, it was all about really kind of um, economy of movement. You know what would these synths do, and actually they'd do their their task as quickly and as effectively as they could, but with saving energy. Um, and actually, what we found was it was kind of like lowering kind of heart rate actually you know so kind of breathing and kind of getting into this zen-like state to smoothly move move around and then when the actors got when you know when uh, the real synths got and then we really started to and then they cast me hone and, it and find um, it all of that went out the window. yeah that was that was the the idea i think um 
but the, yeah, it, it was um, the outtakes from the show would just be me <laughs> bumping into the set, <laughs> yeah. uh, tripping over things. And there was, did you remember that take where I fell down the stairs? <laughs> <laughs> the whole crew just laugh, laughing at me because oh, I'm quite fidgety and um, clumsy. So it was, it was a I'm challenge. Often drunk. <laughs> I, it was lovely having Dan after a take come up to, to go up to all the synths and say how well they did and then say to me well done you were really human the way you <laughs> I take all the praise yeah. Yeah. but it's actually it's, it's really hard work isn't it because you, you know you, just me doing it now fidgeting constantly kind of moving um, to actually be still and focused is uh, is extremely hard work you know and especially when you're doing it 12 hours a day you know so I thought I was yeah. cast because I was quite sort of synth like as a human <laughs> being and I've realised I was actually cast because I'm incredibly fidgety and ludicrous <laughs> yeah. and I'm ludicrously human and, uh, <laughs> so I didn't have to do anything which yeah. was great didn't have to smooth <laughs> out our speech impediments all the things that you usually get paranoid about I I was able to embrace and think they were a character choice. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I mean, playing a synth must have been complicated, but playing against a synth is, is interesting. Do you deal with that? Yeah. Yeah, it was quite mesmeric. It, it, there was something, it, I think it's easy to be, um, uh, to, to catch their pace. Yeah. And Anita had a, a great stillness and calm. and. Um, I think sometimes those scenes were longer than they <laughs> needed to be. So, because I was, I was sort of sucked in as Laura, as Laura would have been, to this very uh, gorgeous but um, quite mesmerising energy. Um, uh, yeah, it was a, a new experience to act with it. Makes you very scene. aware of yourself, enormously aware of yourself. I became very. <laughs> I, I did the opposite. I started, I started doing things a lot quicker whenever I had scenes with Jeff because. I became very aware that there was the silences were dangerous and scary, <laughs> <laughs> and so I just start saying my lines a bit quicker. Uh, it's, it's Which kind allowed of my scenes to be really slow. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, who was really good at doing an impression of a synth is um, Pixie, who plays, who's amazing, who plays Sophie, the youngest daughter, and she would copy um, my movements and just be right off it. And she, she's better than me, really. Um, very good. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, I'm just nothing significant. Will you turn your head like a synth or something just so we see how the movement goes? Just something very... Oh, oh, well, well, we decided, so we sort of came up with a uniform um, physical set of... physical language and a set of rules for all of the synths and then we tried to personali personalise them for each individual character. But one of the basic things we decided, um, or Dan decided, I'm going to take credit for it, um, was that um, when you turn your head... So as a, as a human, when you... If someone calls if Catherine said my name over here, um, I, I, and if I was talking to someone, I would start, maybe start turning my head, but my eyes would still be looking at whatever I was looking at there, and then the eyes would be last to, to turn. But we decided as a synth that it would be the opposite corkscrew, so the eyes would lead first, and then the head, and then the body. So just that small thing was hopefully gives it a sense of it not being human, it being um, other, which is what the writers and director and producers wanted. And so, obviously, there's some philosophical questions around the AI thing. How, how deeply did everyone have to research this? Were you all sci-fi buffs, or was this kind of starting from scratch? I read, like, as a teenager, I just read so much of this stuff. So it was, I was ludicrously excited coming in for this, because I, I was saturated with Asimov and Philip K. Dick and Arthur C. Clarke and Wyndham and Wells. And so it was all, you know, this was, the, this was my dream, to sort of be in that uh, world mm -hmm. and it, it's quite um, terrifying to suddenly find yourself in the middle of a fantasy world that you've spent most of your teenage years in the middle of and to realise exactly how powerless you are in that, in that state as well so in that sense it was, it was fascinating because it meant you didn't have to do a, a lot of work whereas actually constructing the ethical and moral and philosophical problems are something that is actually incredibly difficult to do. Mm. Um. <laughs> 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 this works along the road, we'll just make it easier. So, so Gemma, then, Kat, how, do you, how about you with the... Yeah, I'm a, well, I'm a huge sci-fi fan, so I was really happy to be involved with the show, and um, 
yeah, I just read and absorbed as much as I, I could. And um, when we started, um, I read a really great um, graphic novel called Alex and Ada, which is about a lonely young guy who gets bought a, the equivalent of a synth by his grandmother and is adjusting to life with it. And I, it was, it was great. I immersed myself in it, in the world. Um, I've I've read more Judy Bloom than Asimov, <laughs> but but uh, I was really taken with the script because my degree, which was a long time ago now, but I I did a paper called Philosophy of Mind, and papers like Metaphysics and Epistemology and Ethics. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and I actually did very badly on all of those. Uh, um, much I thought I'd absolutely triumphed and came out thinking I was a genius and I had coined in that exam, you know, uh, philosophical arguments that have never been thought of before. But it did get me thinking about other minds and what it is to be human, identity, and you know, uh, all those questions. And I felt like these scripts really opened up those debates, which is all philosophy does. It poses the questions and doesn't provide the answers. Uh, uh, and, and I think that's what you tried to do. You weren't trying to um, present a, a sort of utopian version of events or a dystopian <coughs> one. It was just um, talking about it. And I, I, so my interests were very, uh, well, I'm going to go away now and read Asimov. I was Googling uh, Asimov in the car on the way here. So. <laughs> um, and Sam and I are both big uh, sci-fi fans, um, but we we did a lot of uh, sort of reading around the subject, uh, didn't we? We read uh, Super Intelligence was uh, by um, Nick Bostrom. There we go. Uh, that's why we worked together. <laughs> um, uh, that, that was a great book, and we, we went to a couple of um, conferences as well, and debates um, uh, uh, on uh, artificial intelligence. Um, one of which was something we sort of touched on a bit later in the series about sort of the economies, uh, what's going to happen to the economy. Um, Artificial intelligence and sort of technology and robots start to be uh, more integrated into society. Yeah, and it's sort of less so the kind of hard technical technological aspect of AI. That sort of was it was we needed to know about it, but much more fruitful for the storytelling were the was the philosophy side of things, such as the nature of consciousness and trying to find out what. I mean, the, the spoiler is that nobody seems to know. So series two, hopefully, we'll, we'll nail that. Hurt yourself. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I enjoy a lot of sci-fi, but the you know the main attraction for me w was was the human side of it. You know, it, it was how it was how our family essentially were, were going to deal with these, and and how um, you know for the family and for Laura in particular, it was a cuckoo in the nest story. You know, so I was much more interested in the human side and and, and how each actually different member of the family dealt with the, with the AI and, uh, you know, and they, how that affected their relationships with each other. And how, is that what you, do you take the cooker in the nest piece away from it? Uh, well, I mean, I thought a lot, particularly in those opening episodes of The Hand That Rocks the Cradle, that absolutely brilliantly terrifying uh, film. And mm. I, I did start filming when I had a, a, a three minute old baby. <laughs> she gets younger and younger every time I do an interview. But no, she was about five weeks, six weeks old when I started filming. And uh, I felt very strongly, um, I identified with Laura's feelings of being usurped in the nest, having somebody else or something else uh, tend to her youngest child, child's needs. And how even if you think that isn't actually a human with, with <coughs> sentient feelings, you know, it still uh, challenges you and makes you feel usurped because the child had forms an attachment nevertheless. And so mm -hmm. I felt I felt all those things really keenly. <laughs> I think the family would it, you could do that in a, in a way where the the husband is the one who stays out at work all the time, and you'd have a male. Um, but the dynamics in this well, they seem very contemporary, but they also seem to set up a very different set of of problems for the for the family unit. And how did you how did you find that, Tom? I know that. Well, the, th the thing about Joe is that he thinks it's a solution. He, he thinks bringing an eater in is going to help his relationship and allow the household to run better. It'll be good for the kids, you know, rather the way that most blokes do when they buy an Xbox. <laughs> uh, so it's... Uh, well, an Xbox yeah. wouldn't give us more time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So the, but the truth of the matter is it's not necessarily going to, going to help things along, uh, as, as indeed an Xbox doesn't. <laughs> so... Um, 
So in that sense, he just made a massive error of judgment in thinking it was going to help his relationship. Um, so there's uh, there's questions like that that um, that come very much to the fore with Joe because he's not he doesn't see any of any of it coming. Mm -hmm. So that and that that's the, the sort of point really <laughs> is that he doesn't see it coming at all. There's also an irony there as well. I think is that he, he buys Anita so they, the family can actually spend more time together as a unit. But actually, what happens is is that um, Matty spends more time than. Uh, online and and Toby's on his Xbox, which more so if he's watching this, you know. So actually, they've got more time, but they but not together because they've also got their different relationships with technology as well. Um, and actually, I was thinking in terms of within the family. I mean, how do you think through scenes and roles if you're thinking like a machine? What what? How do you approach you know motivation and so forth? Yeah, uh, in a different kind of way. <coughs> actually, and trying to find a way, um, well, probably didn't see it so much there in, in this episode, but later on there are scenes where it was required that I had to express, you know, or Anita had to express more emotion, um, and, and it was finding a way of, of doing it in a, in, a different, in a different way. But I found, I found it really tricky because, particularly at the beginning, um, there was so much technical stuff in your mind um, that you had to kind of remember like oh, it's five steps to there and then that's where you have to turn to go through the door and whatever so there was just so much going on um, to be honest I was just just trying to tread water and keep my face <laughs> kind of blank and not not show that all of that stuff going on uh, or the effort of all of that and um, remembering um, going on uh, at the same time to be fair that's what I'm like though <laughs> I'm just trying to make sure I get through the door. <laughs> Don't admit that. But um, as I think watching it again, I, I was struck by Matty when she says, it, when I say to her, you know, with, um, she's not a slave. And I, I think the show also explores the way we perhaps dehumanise people that are, are taking the more menial jobs in our society. And I thought that was... Mm. So, so I, obviously it is um, a sci-fi show in many ways, but... I um, I think it hopefully offers so many other um, debates and will hopefully reach so many different audiences because I think um, I think it's uh, so interesting and, and poses so many questions, important questions. Mm -hmm. uh, you were referring to that a bit earlier about the uh, the economy thing, but uh, and obviously this is AMC involved in that. It felt like almost like a Californian. Um, fruit farm where they, where they were all standing in line picking. It felt like in America these people would be Mexican immigrants and it would be a, a legal issue with the whole area. So was this something that you were, that attitude something you were trying to address? Yeah, I mean I think we probably wrote in some parallels that are kind of very unsubtle sort of reminds of that such as the way Fred has been branded on his arm when he's been kind of co-opted into this um, sort of enforcement work gang kind of picking um, vegetables and fruit yeah we wanted to sort of very much hit those things quite square on in a way and hopefully um, provoke a question and a thought about how we might treat these things when we could treat them however we wanted and you know we've thought we've thought and felt similarly about um, different classes and types of people many times like that in history and how do we think about these people when it arguably really doesn't matter what you do to them. And is that, I mean, for instance, do you think that this will happen? You set it very much in now, an alternate version of now. Do you think it is feasible that we could live in that kind of world, particularly from the research you've done and the conferences you attended? I think, you know, it, it, it's, it's certainly a sort of a world that's sort of just around the corner. Um, I think the things we were trying to explore, as Sam was saying, you know, it's 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 more about what it would do to us, what it would do to humanity, you know, um, if we were able to treat these things however we wanted to, you know, what what it would mean for us, it's the, the irreparable damage um, uh, to us and to our society, um, um, if, you know, if we would have these things and treat them however we want. It's also not that far away though, because I, I read the other day about this hotel in Japan where. It's, it's going to open this summer and it's going to be completely staffed by robots and you check in and a robot checks you in and it speaks four languages and you won't see a human the whole time you're there, a robot can do it. This is actually real. Um, so it, it's really not that, that far off. It's, um, it's now. And so again, with, with the contemporary versus the sci-fi tropes, how you, you're directing it in a very realistic 
kind of very contemporary well, what fashion. We, yeah, what we thought was if you took um, like the iPad five five years ago, nobody had one, and then suddenly they were out, and you know your friend would have one, and you'd grab it, and you you know you'd have a look, and you'd have a swipe, and you'd do all all that, and um, and it was just this amazing thing. Um, and then within five years, it's, we're really quite blasé about it. You know, everybody's got one. You know, you've seen them a thousand times. Um, and we've, we've kind of set this at that stage where we are now with the iPads, haven't we, where it's kind of five years or so down the line since they've been introduced. And, you know, and they, you know. So am I, am I an iPhone 6? <laughs> You're an iPhone 6, yeah. Calculator. And Odie's like an iPhone 1 with a cracked yeah. screen. And a yeah. but, but technology moves so quickly that what we didn't want to do was go down the kind of, you know, um, like the AI route where, you know, everyone's in spaceship cars and... Uh, you know, it's really futuristic because actually technology moves so quick that um, people s will still have their crappy people carriers, you know, their kind of normal kitchens and their still be lawyers and, you know, managers of factories and what have you. So, um, so yeah, so that's why we kind of based it, you know, kept it very much in reality, really. So if it did come to pass, would all of you buy one? Yeah. Is, you know, it's pathetic, isn't it? You know, it's so human. <laughs> yeah, I would. Um, I'd get a very ugly one. <laughs> um, I'd get a really handsome male. <laughs> really strong. Yeah. Jim. Oh uh, yeah, I'd get one. I, you know, I'm too too curious. You know, I'm a technological optimist. I think you know, sure they might be detrimental to humanity in the long term. <laughs> <laughs> but they're going to do a lot of washing up. <laughs> um, I'll be the party pooper here. I, I've got a young son, and I always think that um, it probably, you know, an, an unthinking, unfeeling machine that looked just like a human being, that would do something very troubling to his development of empathy and human connection, you know, looking up at that face, thinking it's a person but getting nothing back, oh. really. Um, so, um, yeah, just to bring down the mood there, I'm going to say no. I don't, I don't think I would either. I mean, like, I've got a two and a half year old who was um, just started watching a show called Andy's Dinosaur Adventures. And um, so he was watching it today, and I went to him and I said to him, Come, we'll go outside and I'll hide all these little dinosaurs for you, and you can go out and you, know, you can go on your own little dinosaur adventure, which we've done loads of times before. Um, but he was just like, No. I was like, you know, why not? It's just like, I'm with Andy. <laughs> <laughs> Andy is nice, though. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, you know, it broke my heart that he's, you know, he'd much prefer to be sat in front of the TV watching Andy's dinosaur instead of actually mm. being out in the garden playing with me. So, um... <laughs> so, um... <laughs> <laughs> so, um <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I wouldn't go on. 